Why is this video so long? Well, you see, I'm showing you the four bearings method that you can use while you're on the move. And that does take a bit of time since we are taking a bearing to our target every 15 minutes. And I explain a lot in between. Now, this method will greatly help you if you want to gather all the target data without actually being on the surface. This might become important in bad weather or later on in the war when the destroyers start to have radar, you might not want to approach a convoy on the surface. This method allows you to gather all the target data while you are submerged and even beyond visual range. Please check out the video description. I have linked a few things that I mentioned. And now let's continue with the video. Have fun! Hello my fellow captains. Isn't this nice? Yeah, let me just get below decks really quick. So, as you just saw, the weather upstairs is absolutely terrible. Um, let me just switch on the UI. Okay, so we currently have a medium fog outside and heavy rains. So, our visibility is limited to like 2 to 3 kilometers. And what we also have is a enemy convoy, a small one, somewhere in this area, and we want to find them, but with this river up top, um, finding them visually will be very, very difficult. So we have no other choice but to use our hydrophone. So let's get below water. We are diving. And what we'll also do is we will stop the engines to make it easier for our hydrophone to pick up noise. Neue Tiefe 3, 0 Meter. Neuer Kontakt, Frachter mit schneller Fahrt. Auf gleichbleibender Entfernung. Peilung 6, 7. In großer Tiefe Entfernung. Tiefe beträgt 1, 0 Meter. Tiefe beträgt 2, 0 Meter. Alright, let's listen in. Oh yeah, you hear that? I think those are two ships. Yeah. My guess is these are two ships. So, let me explain what we are trying to do today. We are trying to use the four bearings method to gather target data. So we want to know where our target is, we want to know at what speed it is going and in which direction it is going. So we want to know position, course and speed. That's all the data that we need. Oh, that rhymed. Awesome. Well, anyway, um, some of you might already know the normal four bearings method where you basically take three bearings at specified time intervals like for example every five minutes and then you change your position uh, as far away as you are able to and you basically calculate a, a potential fourth bearing that would have happened if you stayed in your first position and you take a new fourth bearing from your new position and where these two bearings meet is where your target currently is. We will do something similar 
but as I already said once, um, it is unrealistic for your submarine to stay completely still in the water in the same position. There are currents at sea, um, you've seen the weather up there, it's not nice, so we would be moved around if we just turned off the engines and came to a stop. Now, what we are therefore trying to do is we will adapt this method to be used while we are on the move. We will not be moving fast, at least not all the time, but we will be moving nonetheless. And this helps us in many ways. It can allow us to get closer to our target while we take these measurements. And yeah, that's, uh, that's already the main advantage. You can also use this method by being on the surface, for example, with the Yuzo, um, if you are shadowing a convoy. So there it, it also helps to be able to do this while you are on the move. Now, what we will do is, first of all, our targets are off to the side here. And I fear that they are basically going on an opposite course to others. So with time, they might actually pass into our baffles behind us, so I will not be able to hear them in the hydrophone anymore. This is something that I do not want to happen, obviously. So what I will do now is I will turn the boat to basically point directly at them, and then we will start to take our bearings. So let me speed this up, and we are turning 80 degrees Beide Maschinen große Fahrt voraus. Beide große! Neuer Kurs! 80 degrees to starboard. Okay. I'll let the boat turn, and then I'll come back to you. See you soon. So, welcome back. We have just completed our turn. And one thing that I would like to draw your attention to is this compass here in the radio room. So we are currently on our course of 5 degrees. But if you look on this compass, then we are actually almost on a course of 5.5 degrees. Yes, the variation is not very high, but let's, let's just take a look Ruder, at this. Null, For example... If we look at the compass in a moment, I've just um, turned the rudder a little bit to starboard. Now you can see we are already at five and a half degrees. And soon we will be at something along the lines of 5.8 to 5.9 degrees. And this obviously is much closer to 6 degrees than it is to 5 degrees. Now you see the issue is that your course in many instances will still be displayed as 5 degrees although you are not on 5 degrees anymore. So I like before I start my bearing, uh, excuse me, before I start taking my bearings and everything, I like to to be clear that my course is yeah more or less correct. That's fine. Now, the next thing I want to do is to reduce my speed. In fact, let's stop the engines so that we slow down a bit faster. Oh, did I just start that then? I didn't intend to shift the rudder. That was unfortunate. Uh, let's go back to 5 degrees if possible. Yeah, they take a little bit too weird. Okay, that's alright. So 5 degrees it is. Awesome. We are slowing down. And I would like to take this time to explain to you the theory behind this method. Why does this work? So let's imagine we are standing completely still in the water. We are using the traditional four bearings method. Let's just say that. And we are here and our target is 
like up here going like this. Now let's also say that our target is traveling a distance of I don't know, yeah, six and a half kilometers every ten minutes. Then obviously the first bearing that we take will be this one. I'm just doing this quick now. The second will be something like this. And let me move this here. And the third bearing will be something like that. And then the fourth bearing will be, oh come on, will be something like this. Now, the more observant among you have noted one specific thing. The distances between these points where the bearings that I take intersect the target's course are exactly the same. So just to illustrate 6400 meters, 6400 meters and 6400 meters and these uh, will stay the same while we take bearings as long as we take those bearings at a specified time. So if we assume that these bearings have been taken every 10 minutes then if we take another bearing after 10 minutes it will be like this. So you see this is the main reason why this works. These distances stay the same. What we are trying to do with the four bearing method regardless if we are standing still or moving is we are trying to find the line that intersects those bearings where all the distances between the intersections are the same. We are trying to find this line, the course and position of the target. Obviously we could move this line, for example, like this. Or let's just use a drastic example. No, oh, that's alright. Now, will the distances here be the same? Let's find out. So, yeah, pretty much. Uh, not really, you see? And this is why there's only one correct solution to our problem. It is the target's true position and course. Everything else will not fit. Alright, that's the, the uh, the theory behind this all. Now I will show you how we actually do it. Now first of all, I want my submarine to move in a constant direction with a constant speed. And regarding the constant speed, these two guys, well, they will be trouble. You see the problem is that they are constantly trying to keep you at the depth that you have set, in this case 29 meters. And as your boat accelerates, they will have to increase the, di um, the dive plane angle to stay at the same depth because as your boat goes faster, it gets lift on the planes and it tries to rise. Now, since we absolutely need a constant speed, I will turn those guys off by going to our manual dive plane controls and setting both dive planes to zero degrees. There we go. Now they will not interfere any longer with our operations and our speed will remain constant. Um, if I don't forget it, I will link a video in the description explaining um, why you sometimes have to do this to get a higher speed underwater and also a better acceleration. So have a look at that if you didn't already. Now the next thing that we want to do is 
we want to draw our own course. And I guess this is the part where the disclaimers come in. For this method to work, it is absolutely necessary that we know our own position when we take our bearings to the target. It is imperative that we know our correct position when we take the bearings to the targets. If we get this wrong, this method will not work. Now if you have map contacts enabled and you have the position of your own submarine on the map, that's perfect. You don't have to worry, you will always know exactly where you are. But if you are playing like me, with disabled map contacts and basically full realism, then it does get a little bit more difficult. Now what I could do is, I could ask my navigator to calculate our current position. I don't want to do that because he's not very accurate and he, yeah, well, he will be off by a few hundred meters and that's enough to ruin our whole calculation. So what I will do is I know that I will be traveling at a speed of 1.5 knots. Alright, that will be my speed. As soon as the boat has sped up a little bit and with the dive plane set to zero, 1.5 will be my speed. I know that because, well, it's not the first time I play this game. Now at 1.5 knots, that means if we look into our speed conversions, and we say that, yeah, let's just say that we will take a bearing every 15 minutes. And if we go two knots, then we will travel 925 meters in um, 15 minutes. But if we go only 1.5 knots, then that means we are traveling 693 94 meters every 15 minutes. Alright, 693 or 94 if we round it up. That's important to know, we need to remember that number. Okay. Because what we will do is we will take this and we will draw our course was 5 degrees and we will draw those almost 700 meters so it will be somewhere here, okay that's not ideal, okay, like this so you see where we change from 650 meters to 700 meters indicated on the map I want to hit exactly that sweet spot before the 700 meter uh, note appears like this. So awesome. This will be my course. And now I can move this to the side. Let me draw my course properly because we'll also need it for later. that that's okay. No actually we need it longer. We need it much longer. Alright, so this is my current course. There we go. And this here is how far I will travel in fifteen minutes by going at this speed. Now let's get to the hydrophone. Where's our contact? My speed is 1.5 knots as I predicted. And my contact is directly in front of us. Somewhere. So this function here to lock or unlock your hydrophone, um, I use this because, well, in real life you would have a skilled 
hydrophone operator who wouldn't have any trouble to stay on a specific contact because his hydrophone would have a bit more options than the one in the game currently has. I mean, the only thing that we can do is we can turn this wheel to change the um, bearing where we are listening to. We have no... I mean, this um, volume knob here doesn't even work. Uh, we have no option to modify the gain of the hydrophone. We have no option to manipulate the width of our listening cone. There, there is nothing. And well, it's basically useless to us as it is now. So I have no issues with using this function just to make sure that I stay on the same contact. And what we will do now is we will bring up our clock. The second thing that um, we need for this method to work is we need to take a bearing at a specified time interval. So, for example, every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes, whatever, but we need to be precise with our time. So I will wait now for the bearing to change to 2 degrees and then I will start the clock and from then on we have to be quick although 15 minutes between the bearings that gives us um, enough time to do everything it should be fine should be any second now There we go. Okay, our clock is ticking. And we took our first bearing at 2 degrees. So let's bring up our attack disk. And set this to 2 degrees on the bearing ring. This is the outer one. By the way, if I don't forget it, I will link a video in the description where I explain how to use this lovely tool. Do take a look at that if you didn't already, it's very useful. Um, for example, in this instance, the attack disk will help us to convert our relative bearing to a true compass bearing. So we know 2 degrees is our bearing to target, and we can see on this middle ring here that this gives us a true bearing of 7 degrees. Alright, that means... Let me just move this here, okay. 7 degrees... There's somewhere over here. So 7... By the way, if I don't forget it, <laughs> I know I say this a lot, if I don't forget it, I'll link um, in the description the mod that I'm using to get this compass tool, which is a bit more precise than what you usually get with Wolves of Steel. You should be able to install it alongside Wolves of Steel without any problems. So I'm trying to line up 7 degrees on both the inner ring and the outer ring will give me the maximum precision. Yeah, that's another thing that you need to be really careful about, because if you don't, then this method will not work. You need to be very precise with your bearings that you draw. And I know that can be difficult, because this disk here, that you cannot zoom on to that there is no zoom function and it is very hard to read the bearing lines on this one. I mean, can you tell without looking at the number up here at what, at how many degrees uh, our target is? I couldn't. Like for example, I wouldn't say that this is four degrees, I would say this is three and a half or something like that. It's stupid that we have such a bad really bad representation of a hydrophone in-game. 
in, well, this is unfortunately a very big weakness of Silent Hunter 5. The Hydro Throne is um, trash in general. I'm sorry to say it like that, but yeah, there's no way around it, it's trash. But it can serve as well. Even in this state, there's a lot that we can do with it and it does help to... Oh well, it does help in some ways. Right now, I've taken my first bearing, as we already discussed. Um, we'll take the second bearing from this position. I'll come to that in a moment, or in exactly 12 minutes. Uh, don't worry, I will not keep you waiting that long, I will make a cut. But, yeah, there is one thing that we can already do for later. We will need two lines that are parallel to our first bearing. And we can already draw those lines, we can use this time. How do you draw a parallel in Silent Hunter 5? Well, it's not hard. You take the compass tool and there we go and you draw a line ex that overlaps your line that you want to have a parallel to as precisely as possible there we go and now you can move this around and you have a perfect parallel line so, we need a second one. I will need those for later. And I'm just using the time that we now have, where we don't have to do much, to already prepare a few things. Okay, there's our second parallel line. Nice. Um, one thing that I should do now and I think I'll blow a lot of people's brains with this one. Have a look at this. So, the compass is here. Well, later on in this video we will have all kinds of lines here. It will be messy. It really will be messy and it will be hard to see what we're exactly looking at. So how about we bring some color into this? Now I go to the compass tool on the left side here and I right click. Boom, it brings up an interface where we can change the compass color. Isn't that nice? So what I will do is... Uh, if this starts to work, there we go. Let's for example make compass lines blue in color. So we set up the color, we click here to apply the color, we close this and now if we draw that, yeah, now all compass two lines have changed to a blue color. Unfortunately, I cannot um, define a new color for each line that I draw. That would be amazing, but it doesn't work. What we can do is we can basically change globally the colors for all lines, for all uh, circles, for all protractor lines, etc. So yeah, I don't need this one. Let us also... Uh, navigation fix, not super mark, marker. Let us also change the color for markers. Let's make that... red into the mix and come on can be a bit fiddly from time to time and let's also bring a bit of green into the mix if you had art in school you know that this gives us yellow there we go now if we place a marker it will be yellow I want a brighter yellow bump up the alpha value. Get one. That's okay. J 
just to distinguish them a little bit better to make this uh, easier to read later on. Okay. So right now uh, we will wait for a few more minutes and then I'll be back with you. See you soon. Welcome back. So right now we just passed the 14 minute mark. So in one minute we need to take our next bearing. Right now I am looking at this really hard to read disk and I'm looking at this number here to see when it will change. I need these bearings to be as precise as possible. I really do. So this is why I pay attention to this. Now the bearing has just changed to 14 degrees and it might change to 15 before the 15 minute mark has passed. But yeah, I'm looking at this so that I maybe, maybe, maybe can judge better if we are looking at 14 degrees, if we are looking at 14 and a half, if we are looking at almost 15, but this is still displaying 14. There we go. It should be almost 15, I guess. I think in a few seconds this will change. Or oh, it is 14 and a half. See, this is so hard to read. I really hate this disc. Yeah, we'll just go with 14 and a half, I guess. Fourteen and a half it is. No, back to our map. We bring up our attack disk again. So fourteen and a half degrees gives us a true bearing of nineteen and a half. Let me draw that. So this was our position at the fifteen minute mark. And we are doing 90 and a half degrees for the bearing. You see, it's important to get this right because, uh, well, if we used 14, that would be over here. And if we used 15, that would be already over here. It doesn't look like a huge difference, but trust me, it is. And it really messes up all the later stages of this process. So 14 and a half. There we go. Now we have to wait again 15 minutes, but before we do that, I will simply take this ring and I will move it to our position at the 15 minute mark, and so I will know that the next bearing will be taken from this position. What we will also do in preparation for our later calculations is we will draw a line, a completely random line that is crossing both bearings, like so. We will do the same a second time. Both lines are completely random. I just uh, think it's best to draw them as perpendicular as possible to your bearings. So I have drawn them like this. It doesn't matter where you draw them along the bearings. I think if you draw them a little bit out like this, it does help with the precision later on, but that's okay. Now what we need to do is, we need to go to where this random line intersects our second bearing. And we draw a circle from this intersection to where it intersects our first bearing, like so. And we do the same thing on the second random line. Again, like, like so. Now we will place a mark at the points where these 
circles intersect the uh, random line that we drew on the opposite side from bearing 1. So I will place a marker right here. There we go. And I will place one right here. This pusher is enough. Could be moved just a tiny bit. There we go. There's two marks. You know what? Let me see if I can make this color a little bit more vivid. I still don't like it that much, but okay, here we go. can be fiddly to find the correct spot where your mouse wheel will do anything. Uh, there it was. Okay, we cannot turn up the alpha any higher. We can turn down the blue color. We can... Come on. There we go. There it is. Yeah, give it more green. Give it a greener tone. Bright green. That's good. We'll use bright green. Let me place a mark so that they change color. Awesome. That works. Alright. Now what we do, um, the two parallels that we prepared earlier, we will place one each on these marks. So what will happen later on is that we will take bearing number 3 and this bearing number 3 will cross these lines at some point. And the intersections will be important to us. You will see why in a moment. For now I will make another cut and I'll see you again once we are at the 30 minute mark. See you soon. Welcome back. So we are coming up on the 29 minute mark right now. And so in one minute we have to take our next measurement and we are now observing the bearing mark here. Now one important thing that is going to happen after we take our bearing is that we will speed up. We need to break our own pattern of movement. So we either have to do a drastic course change or we need to change our speed and we will choose to do the later one because it's easier to keep track of your own position if you just change your speed and if you don't have to wait for your boat to turn. So right now it's still showing 26 for almost a full minute. I will actually start to speed up right now. By the machine now, car for out. 27. Okay, 27 degrees. Right now I'm observing to see how long it takes to change my speed. We will remember 27. By doing this. And I want to speed up to 6 knots. So speeding up took almost a minute. Um, hmm. I guess for that I will use yeah, I guess for that I will use uh, average speed of 4 knots for 1 minute. Okay, we are doing a speed of 5.9 knots. <laughs> A 
let me have a look at the speed telegraph here. Yeah, 5.9 seems to be about right. And I think, no, 5.8. Yeah, 5.8. So you see, um, the thing is that as your batteries are drained, um, you will actually lose speed. So we will now assume that we are traveling with a speed of 5.8 knots. But first of all, okay, let's get out of here. This is a little bit more quiet. First of all, we will draw our bearing and then we will worry about our own position. So it was 27 degrees. That gives us a true bearing of 32 from this position here. 32, 32, 32 is over in this direction, just like, in fact, let me go here, so, 32, just like this, yeah, ah, okay, now you see it actually doesn't cut the lines that we prepared, so we will have to move them a little bit. That happens. Not too tragic. But right now I will first worry about where we will be when we take our bearing number 4. So we know that for one minute we will use an average speed of 4 knots, that means we have moved about 100 meters in that minute, let's say 150 uh, yeah, let's say 150. Okay, so... Just below 150. Yeah, let's use that. And place it here. size like so and we assume that we are going 5.8 knots for the rest of um, the time that we are waiting for 14 minutes so 5.8 okay so right now I'm looking at the calculator if we go uh, 15 minutes if we go 925 meters then oh yeah we need 14 minutes excuse me so if we go 16 meters in a minute times 14 that gives us 814 840 meters in 14 minutes if we were going at a speed of 2 knots divided by 2, this gives us 420 meters in 14 minutes if we were going at a speed of 1 knot. Oh, 5.7. We are losing speed. That's not good. Why are we doing that? Hmm. I hope we don't keep losing speed. Okay, we are using 5.7 right now. Okay, 420 times 5.7 gives us 2,394 meters. 2,394 meters. Oh, come on. Two thousand three hundred speed 
is still constant and we will see if that changes. I hope not. If it doesn't change then hereabouts should be our position after the next 15 minutes have passed. Alright, now let's see what we can do about this here. I need to move these parallel lines and I need to make sure that they are still intersecting the mark that we placed. So I'm moving it a little bit to the right. That was a little bit too much. Okay, that should be fine. Yeah, that works. Same thing up here. Oh, perfect. Awesome. Now, the intersections of the parallel lines to B1, uh, B1 in this case being our bearing number 1, and our bearing number 3, we will place marks, because these points will now be important to us. What we are doing right now is we are trying to determine where our fourth bearing would have been if we didn't change our speed. So what I will do right now is I will take this circle and I will move the end points to the marker that we just placed like so and then I will take the whole circle and move it to here. I could have also drawn a line that is passing through this mark and through this intersection and then drawn a circle with this as its middle point and then marked the um, position on the opposite side on the line but um, this here is easier. Just move the circle set up the radius and move the circle. So this point right here needs a mark placed on it. There we go. We are doing the same thing up here. So we are oh, we are not drawing a new one. We are dragging this one to the mark that we placed earlier and then we are moving the whole circle and this gives us another mark here mark 8 and mark 9 will now be where we draw a line there we go And if we go ahead and we extend this line, like so, let me see if I'm precise enough. No, it needs to be moved just a little bit. Should be alright. That just was a little bit too much indeed. Like so, maybe. Yeah, close enough. I'll just move it a little bit more. Like so. That should be fine. That's actually perfect. I'm proud of myself. So now you see... ...that this is intersecting our course here. And if I would not have... We're still doing 5.7 knots, that's nice to see. If I would not have... In fact, let me do this really quick. Our, our previous speed, where we made 650 meters in 15 minutes. And if I now go ahead and I move it to here, then we can see...
and we can see that this actually would have been our bearing number four if we would not have changed our speed. So with some advanced geometry we were able to predict where our bearing would have to target would have been if we would not have changed our speed. But we did change our speed and so our position at the 15 minute mark will be up here and we will take a new bearing to target and it will intersect this line that we just drew somewhere well we see where but it will intersect the line somewhere and that will be the approximate position of our target at that point in time so already this method has helped us to succeed in one very important thing we will know exactly well exactly is a strong word there might be a few hundred meters of irregular uh, of, of a little error right there but that's not too important but it will help us to know where our target is and from there on we will continue to calculate where they are going and how fast they are doing um, well how the speed they are doing excuse me it's late so I think we have just did we just pass the 14 minute mark we need to get back to our hydrophone and that will be a little bit loud this time I'm sorry for that but there's no helping it so 41 degrees this was the 14 minutes mark or if we are coming up to 14 minutes right now yeah okay now it's one minute more that we have to wait but yeah just looking at this again this is already amazing what we managed to do and we are doing still 5.7 knots that's good um, 15 minutes at such a speed that's a long time I hope our position that we determined where we will be is correct. If not, then everything we do from here on out will be wrong. We'll see about that though. showing 42 degrees let's actually slow down 43 just change okay so it was basically almost 43 at the 15 minute mark we do not need to go that fast anymore no reason to drain our batteries needlessly so we did say 43 Using our attack disk we can determine that this gives us a true bearing of... <laughs> Seriously? Did we change course or something? No, 48, yeah, okay. Awesome. 48 measured from this position. Here we have the intersection with our predicted bearing. So mark number 10 marks the spot where our target currently is. So they are 
about 15 kilometers away from me. Okay, that's already giving us a ton of good information. Awesome. Now, I hope that this was correct. If it isn't, then obviously the point where this line intersects the other line will change and it may actually change quite drastically and this will very much interfere with our calculation of target course and target speed so this is um, yeah this is the thing if we were not precise up until this point then this is where we mess up from now on even if we were not 100% precise with this um, the position of the target will still be roughly okay but everything that happens from now on will be completely wrong so what we need to do now is we need to go to this point and we are drawing a random line from here that intersects our third bearing like so okay all right and now I will done before. I will go to this crossing and I will draw a circle with the radius to the target's position. There. And I will place a mark where this circle intersects the random line that we just made. Just like so okay what we will now do is we will draw a line that is parallel to our third bearing using the same method that we used earlier to draw parallel lines just making sure that it's nice and parallel and we will place this on the mark that we just placed. There we go. And now we are looking at the point where this line is crossing our second bearing, which is right here. Okay, we are placing a mark. Now what we want to do is we want to draw a line from this new mark to the target's position like so what I just did is I drew the target's course this is the course of the target right here so the target is traveling on a course of 98 degrees from west to east Amazing, isn't it? What a little bit of advanced geometry can do. Okay, what we will do now is we will extend this line so that it's also passing through bearing number one. Like so. And yeah, pretty much perfect. And remember what I explained earlier about all the um, distances between the points where um, my bearing lines cross the target's course being the same distance. Let's verify that. If we did everything right, then this will match up. So let me draw this. And if I move it over to here, then you can see it intersects. Yeah. The distance is pretty much the same and if we do that oh my god it's perfect so we know now that our target is traveling 3200 meters in 15 minutes and if we look at our conversion tables 3200 meters gives us a speed of seven knots this is awesome so we know our target has been 
obviously it moved, but that's not a problem for us. It has been here. It is traveling on a course of 98 degrees with a speed of 7 knots. And we managed to learn all that by drawing a lot of lines <laughs> and circles. Oh, this is great. Okay. What I can do now is I can grab the target's course and I can extend it. Like... So, let, let's give ourselves our bit, uh, a bit of room here. Just so that we... Actually, let's give us a lot of room. We might need it. Let me check if this matches up. No, it doesn't. Like so, maybe? Ah, almost! Almost, I move it just a little bit and that should be fine. Like there. Yeah, a little bit more. Just for the sake of it. That's nice. Awesome. Now I can go ahead and delete everything that I don't need anymore. I have the target's position where it was, I have the speed, I have the course, I have my bearings. I don't need you, I don't need you. I do not need these things or these things. I also don't need this. I don't need... Do I need that? No, I don't. Don't need that. Don't need that, 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 that. Ah, uh, okay, we can keep that. Why not? The rest is fine. Uh, let me just have a listen. 49 degrees. So 49 gives us a true bearing of... 54 degrees. Come on. 54 degrees. We did travel a little bit at a speed of... Oh, we actually... Okay. Hmm. I'm somewhere along this line, but I don't know exactly where. But I know that... My target has been traveling at a constant speed and it has traveled for almost 10 more minutes with a speed of 7 knots. That means it has moved a further 2160 meters. 2160. Yeah, it should be there right now. And 49 degrees, which gives us, yeah, still our 54 degrees viewed from the position of the target. Just move this over to the side a little bit. Um, the opposite of 54 is obviously 234 because right now we are doing this thing in reverse to <laughs> basically correct for our little failure there to keep track of our position. Did I say 200 and 234? Not 43. Yeah, we did basically stop. Right now I will speed up and I will turn on a parallel course. By the machine, 
90 Neuer degrees. Kurs, 9, 8 Grad. We know this was our position. What I will do now is I will... Oh yeah, we already have that line from um, our target to our position. We have the target's direction of travel, we have the speed, and right now we will calculate an intercept course. If I don't forget it, then in the description I will link a video where I explain how to calculate an intercept course, which I'm doing right now here. So, have a look at that video if you want a good explanation of how I'm doing this. Um, the target is going at 7 knots. We can do a little bit more than that underwater, so in any case we will have to travel above water. And I will travel at a speed of 16 knots. Yeah. 16 knots will be my speed. Let us actually surface the boat and then we'll continue. surfacing. Yep. Alright. The weather is still shit. Okay, let's, let's complete our intercept calculation here. Uh, what did I do? I draw that circle. Awesome. Laufen auf beiden Dieselmaschinen. So Fahrt bei dem Wetter 1, 4. Right now I need my protractor tool from the center of the circle to where the circle cuts this line out there to the contact position about there so we need an 80 degree intercept 18 degrees. That's all right. This one. So from here, 18 degrees. Let's use 20 to get a little bit ahead of our target. Okay. This will give us. Travel of almost 30 kilometers at, oh indeed, at 17 knots. Okay. Don't actually want to go that fast. Let's go to a head full. Okay. So that will be 16 knots almost 30 kilometers. Oh, let's get the clock away. That means it will take us about an hour to get there. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, now all we need to do is to travel along this line until we get to our intercept point here, where we will set, an, set up an ambush. And if the target does not change the speed or the course, then we will know exactly how we have to shoot our torpedo. By the way, we only have one, so... <laughs> 
let's see if we can actually sink both ships. Um, the sea... well, the river is shit, but the sea is calm enough for a deck gun attack if uh, we need to do that. We'll have a look. Um, right now, I will say goodbye until we reach this position here. Um, from this point on, I will actually have my navigator take position fixes every five minutes. Um, that should be... I mean, he is not precise enough for for calculating our position for this method to work, but he's precise enough to calculate our general position where we have to be. Um, and yeah, I still need to turn in. So we need to go on a course of 74 degrees. I mean, just look at that. We know we are nowhere near this area. And look what he did. That's pitiful. Uh, what I will do actually is I will reposition this navigation fix. So press C and I guess we were somewhere around here. Okay, and from here on out he will calculate I hope he will calculate our position as faithfully as he's able to. He's not very good, really. Um, however, that is something that you can change in the um, options file editor viewer, I think. You can actually change the accuracy of the navigator, but I would advise against making him super accurate, because you are at sea. If you have a super accurate navigator, where's the fun in that? Um, if you know, if you can basically tell him to give you your perfect position at all times, that's not fun. Bad weather, um, being submerged for a long time, all those things will make the navigator less accurate because he cannot take any celestial fixes. And there's also some fun in that, because, especially if you navigate in coastal waters. I mean, one time, I was trying to return to Wilhelmshaven, and I had heavy fog. I couldn't see anything. It was terrible. I couldn't see the, um, the navigation buoys. I, there, there was nothing I could see. Just fog. And I tried to find the harbor. And what actually happened is, I ended up in Wesermünde, instead of Wilhelmshaven. I was completely lost. And, yeah, as I said, there's some fun in that. Now, I will let this continue for a while until we reach this position. Or until hopefully we reach that position and then I'll come back to you. So, see you in a bit. Bye-bye. Okay, welcome back. We just had a report from the watch crew. There was a ship somewhere on course 326. Yep, I can see it. Schiff in Sicht, Kurs 326. Neuer Kurs 117 Grad. Neuer Kurs 98 Grad. That should us bring on a parallel course to them. Yeah, that should bring us on a parallel course. So we have found the ships. We still didn't exactly reach the position. Um, I guess we are. Let me see. Yeah, we are about here and they're about there, so we are close enough to spot them through the fog. I should have placed the intercept point further ahead, but it's okay, we can work with this. 302. Okay, out there in the fog, there are two ships. Yep, 
closest one is 291. Schiff in Sicht, Kurs 201. Beide Maschinen AK voraus. Flank Speed. Yeah, if you look very closely, you can just see a shadow here in the fog. Schiff in Sicht, Kurs 200. There is a mast. There seems to be smoke from the smokestack. And there is another one. This one is a little bit easier to see, I think. Schiff in Sicht, Kurs 200. Let's turn a little bit away from them. We don't want to get too close. Although, in these weather conditions, our submarine should be basically impossible to spot. But still, let's be careful. Schiff in Sicht, Kurs 2, 9, 4. Let me get below decks. Okay, this helps you to hear me a little bit better and gives me the opportunity to already set up the torpedo attack. Now, I will go on a 90 degree intercept course and I will fire the torpedo. I know they are going at the speed of 7 knots, I will dial that in a little bit later. For now, I know I will attack them from a 90 degree starboard position. So, angle on bow will be 90 degrees. There. And the speed will be 7 knots. There. And the distance will be short. We'll set it to 2000. For now. I do not know what kind of ship I'm shooting at. But I'll set my torpedo to run at a medium speed, so that means 40 knots. It will run pretty shallow at 3 meters. Yeah, that's alright for now. That should be enough. That should be more than enough. So let's turn. Course 9 degrees. Get below decks, we are diving. We are diving to periscope depth. Oh, come on. Low speed ahead. And I see no gun. But I'm not sure what he has on the back there. It could be a gun. God damn it. Oh man, what to do? No way to say if the second one is armed or not. So we will shoot at this one. There's no way around this. It seems to be the bigger target. Let's go. Fired. There it goes. So, in a moment we will see if our calculations have been correct. But, it looks alright, I guess. I mean, we found them. And the distance to the target isn't too great. Hmm, we'll see. Okay, right now I 
think he's not armed. Then let's hope that this is also the case with the second one. Otherwise we did fire at the wrong ship. Oh, I think this one has a gun right here in front of the mast. But I'm not sure. Could be something else. Yeah, our torpedo is there. There it is. Come on. Close in. Don't spot the torpedo. Uh, uh, uh. We might actually have miscalculated their course by a few degrees. I mean, it looks like he's on an AOB of 90 right about now, instead of here. But that's what the difference of 3 degrees. Yeah, we should, we should still hit if our speed calculation was correct. At least I hope we do. Yeah, I don't see any armament. Okay, that was unfortunate. And I think this is a tanker. Which means a lot of tonnage. Okay, here we go. Right now... We are looking directly at our torpedo. And... If it hits, then it should hit any moment now. Please do hit. Oh, perfect. It's a perfect hit. Awesome. I'm very happy. That, that my friends, that means all those calculations were absolutely correct and I'm so glad that I didn't make a mistake somewhere in between here because um, as you might have noticed this video is quite long and I would have hated to have to redo it let's just say it like that yeah this one I think is indeed armed I think this is a gun if that is the case then I think we will just leave this ship alone and be on our way. Disappear into the fog. And let this one sink. Now let's identify this thing actually. Um, I think it's a tanker. Yeah, it is. That should give us a nice tonnage. Here. T2 tanker. 10,000 tons! Oh, that's nice. Uh, thank you very much, dear British. I totally forgot to look at the flag, oh my god. Um, yeah, dear British. Thank you very much, yes, this, that is indeed a gun. Absolutely, that's a gun. Right in front of the mast. I mean, we could try to attack it from behind, but as soon as he turns, he will be able to fire on us. And... Honestly, at the relatively short range that we have to engage at, um, we are not going to risk that. We are going to leave it alone. Yeah, we are. So, right now we are on our way to the port of Cadiz, I hope you say the name like that, to rendezvous with the um, German resupply ship Thalia, or Thalia, and that's where we'll be going, and I guess they were on their way to Gibraltar right through our patrol area. How unfortunate for them. Or well, at least for this one. So... Yeah. 
It's definitely a gun. Now I'm 100% sure. I'm not going to risk that. We are turning away. And we are speeding up. And we are getting out of here. So, I hope that this video was... Let me just get rid of the clock, we don't need that anymore. I hope that this video was insightful for you, that it did teach you a few things, and that now you are able to use the four bearings method while on the move. You see, it does work and it's absolutely amazing when all things come together and you manage to get that torpedo into the target. Isn't that the reason why we all play this game? Because of this feeling when all the things come together and it just works. Alright then. I will now leave you um, with my best wishes and I look forward to the next tutorial video that I will make or the next gameplay video. I'm not sure yet what will be next. But I'm thinking about making a few tutorials on historic methods that U-Boat Aces used to hit their targets, like for example the Auswanderungsverfahren. We'll see. Um, I'll read up a little bit on that and then think about how to explain this information in a manner that is as easy to understand as possible. And now with a few nice um, views of our sinking targets, I will leave you while I dive to a greater depth. And as soon as we are out of visual range of these targets, we will surface and we will get the hell away from here. So let's take a look at our target that we hit. How is he doing? Well, considering the circumstances, I mean he's still afloat. Tiefe beträgt 2-0 Meter. There's no giant gaping hole in his side. But he is on a lot of fire. So this here, this is a T2 tanker. Um, which means one torpedo might actually not be enough to finish him off. In that case we might not have another choice but to do a Tiefe deck gun attack. 3-0 Meter. If that is necessary, then yeah. You will see it in Neuer a few Kontakt, Frachter yes, mit schneller Fahrt ship auf here gleichbleibender Entfernung. Peilung 197 in mittlerer but Entfernung. It's also armed with a deck gun and with twin AA guns. Twin 20 mm uh, two 20 mm AA guns, excuse me. This one indeed I think was not armed and we could have just sunk the second one and then attacked this one with a deck gun. Yeah, this one was indeed not armed at all. So that was a little tactical error on our side. We could have backed two ships instead of one. But we'll see. Right now I will continue on a parallel course and I will monitor the situation on my hydrophone. And if the ship sinks, then we don't have to do anything. If it doesn't sink, then indeed we will have to go for a deck gun attack. So, see you in a moment. Or, if it's not necessary to perform a deck gun attack. Goodbye, and until the next video. Have a nice day. So, welcome back. Um, this is quite unbelievable. Um, this thing, after waiting for quite a long time 
is still afloat. However, you see in what condition it is, but it's been like that for a good time now, and it's keeping afloat. So we will actually have to go for a deck gun attack. Um, the good thing is, it separated itself from the other ship, so it's very much alone here. And I think a few deck gun rounds hitting their target will be enough to get this thing under the waves. Also, take a listen to this. This... This is our target. Tortured metal. Being dragged through the water. Amazing. Alright, let's set this up. Neuer Kurs, 3, 3, 7, Grad. Beide Maschinen need to turn. Go to battle stations. We are turning towards them. <sighs> I mean, I could also just wait for another hour. But to be honest, I... <laughs> well, the video has been long enough already. So I want to get this done as quick as possible. Also, I kind of have to go to sleep because I have to go to work tomorrow. Come on, keep turning. Yeah, we're picking up speed nicely, even in the turn. Should now start to straighten out soon. Just a few more moments. There we go. Okay, let's surface. speeding towards the surface and we should hit the surface with about seven knots of speed which is quite nice we are surfacing surface there it is Target spotted. Ja, laufen auf beiden Dieselmaschinen. Running on both diesels. Amazing. Laufen auf beiden Dieselmaschinen. Fahrt bei dem Wetter 1, 4. Knoten. 
Okay. Let's get this done. So this is also what the deck gun was originally used for, um, to finish off ships that had been struck by a torpedo. Yeah, the searchlights are of no use to you. You can point them at me all you want. Boat is bobbing in the waves quite a lot. Langsame Fahrt voraus. But that was a hit. A few more and the ship should go down. Nope. Too far. Yeah, the waves are actually affecting us a lot more than one should think with these waves. Okay, I see that most shots are going over the targets. So, aim for the waterline. This will make them aim a bit lower. There we go. Yeah, yeah, searchlights. Have fun with that. Good shot. Keep going. Was a hit as well under the waterline. Uh, that one is too short. Okay, these waves are messing with me. Let's turn. No sign of the other ship, which is important. I guess the other ship right now is uh, running away as fast as it can, and I can't blame it. A few more rounds and we should have it. Yeah, good hit. Yep, still a bit. Good, keep it up. Yep, good one. Sink already. I mean, respect to those sailors, but okay, there we go. There's a radio message unable to control flooding, abandoning ship. Did we spot the other one? Oh, is it coming back? Yeah, we, we do not want to do that. Hold fire. It 
is indeed coming back. Okay. Neuer Kurs. Zwei, zwei, vier, drei. Time for us to get out Beide of here. Maschinen AK voraus. And goodbye to you. then um, that was it for today we sunk a 10,000 ton tanker let's just verify this yeah 10,044 tons which brings my current petrol tonnage up to 69,000 nice um, I will now continue to Cadiz and resupply and then I will hunt a little bit more in this area Currently we have the 17th of June 1941, um, so in a few days something very important should happen involving the Soviet Union and Germany. So I'm looking forward to those radio reports. Um, however, right now I will bid you farewell. I hope this video was entertaining and informative. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments and I will try my best to answer. Have a good day. Bye bye.